We're here today with Dylan Clark, the Democratic candidate for the 95th House seat in the November 6th general election. We appreciate you being here and invite you to start by doing an opening statement about why you decided to run and why you think you're the best candidate for the seat. Well, thank you guys for having me. And uh, so I'm uh, Dylan Clark. I'm running for state rep in the 95th district. I, uh, my wife and I will live in Litchfield. I'm a county board member over there in Montgomery County. And she's a kindergarten teacher. And the reason I decided to get in this fight, the reason I decided to get in this race is because I've seen the damage that Bruce Rauner has caused to my home, to our district, and I knew in my heart it wasn't right, and I wanted to do something about it. Um, my granddad, he's a, he's a union man, he's a good man, he's a wise man, and he's taught me right from wrong, and right to work is definitely wrong. I'm going to fight against right to work all the time. And I'm going to do everything I can for our union families, our state workers, and just on the middle class in general. And also, I want to fight for our schools, I want to fight for our students, I want to fight for our teachers. Andy Menard, he's been doing a good fight in the Senate, and I want to continue his work in the House. Uh, we have a teacher shortage right now. I want, to fight. Um, I want to fight for our teachers in that. But also, we got more student debt today than ever before. And if a kid wants to go to a trade school, they want to go to a college, they want to go to a university, I want to do everything we can to help that kid and hope that they come back to Illinois, help, hope that they come back to our district and make that better too. I also want to fight to bring jobs back here to the 90, well, back to the 95th and back to Illinois. In the last three and a half years, we've lost more jobs than any other state. And that's not right, and that's all because of Bruce Rauner. But the biggest reason I'm running, the biggest reason I'm running is because right now we don't have any representation. We have a representative in there that just kowtows to Bruce Rauner, and that's not right. I'm going to fight for the people in my district, and I'm going to represent the people in my district solely. You know, I always, uh, I always joke every time I speak that uh, – Avery Bourne and I have something in common right now. We both don't represent the 95th. That's going to change this November. So thank you guys for having me. And, you know, just the main point is I want to represent the people in my district solely. So thank you. Um, when you talk about defending the middle class and fighting for everyday men and women, union rights, um, bringing jobs to the district, tell us some specifics about things you think need to happen to, you know, make that happen and how you would work for that. So first off, uh, we need Bruce Rauner out of there. That's a big one. I mean, in the last three and a half years, we've lost more people and more jobs than any other state. And he's just been very anti-union from the start, and Avery Bourne has been too. And, you know, there's also we can do infrastructure projects uh, for the state, and that can get some people to work. But it just the big thing in there is we need an administration that's friendly towards the middle class instead of just catering to the 1%. Um, coal is an important industry in mm -hmm. your, your region, arguably a struggling industry. What policies would you like to see the state adopt when it comes to coal? Well, first off, I have some family members that were coal miners, and I'm very pro-coal myself. Um, actually, we shot a commercial where I went down inside a coal mine. It was a long wall mine, and we saw all the practices they did. Um, I do realize there is you know, other renewable sources out there. And I think we need to look into that. But I think any coal miner will tell you, hey, they're all for that once it's profitable and once there's jobs out there for it, uh, consider, uh, comparing to the coal mine industry. And so right now, I want, to, I want to do everything we can for our coal miners, everything I can for our coal industry, because at this point in time, um, the, renewable, the other renewable sources are not up to that level. When you say that, do all you can do for them, what would that entail? Would that entail? Uh, legislation that would make it easier for them to conduct business, but also just um, legislation also that doesn't hamper them for not being a root, um, one of those other renewable sources. Such as? Uh, wind, solar. Right, but what, what kind of legislation, what kind of changes would need to happen to make it easier for them or not hamper them? I just like basic things. So when I, um, when I went over there to the coal mine, they, they told me, you know, hey, in the last 20 years, we've had our hands tied, you know, with this, with that. And they're kind of punishing for us, us for being a coal mine instead of being a solar farm or a wind farm. Like, it, but, in, but in what ways? What? regulations would need to change um i don't have any of the specifics on me but uh i just i i don't want to uh, tie their hands behind their back anymore essentially um, let's dive into some of the issues you would face if you were a member of the house 
we would argue the biggest issue facing the state is the unfunded pension liability. How would you propose the state address the unfunded liability? Well, first off, uh, a promise is a promise, and we got to pay back these people. Um, I mean, when we look at state workers, too, I mean, they're getting their back pay now, but their step increases they still haven't got, and we need to make sure that they do. Um, but uh, like I said, a promise is a promise. We have to make sure as a state that we follow through with that and get them paid what they're owed. But how, how are we going to do that? I mean, it's, it's, well, the, the unfunded liability yeah, yeah. is estimated at least $130 billion. There are other estimates that are much higher than that. So how, how does the state, how does the legislature go about addressing that so that money is there to, to, to fulfill that promise? I, I would not want any more, any new programs uh, made until those uh, debts are paid. What, what do you mean by new programs? So, you know, every, you know, every time there's a budget, we, uh, you know, there's new programs they, you know, give money towards and do all this. I think that should be first on the docket is, hey, we got to pay back this. And where, where, where would you get the revenue? The revenue? Pay for that? I mean, there's, um, there's a lot of stuff right now that just Bruce Rauner has been using money towards or, like, okay, you know, for the, actually the last three and a half years, we've lost because we didn't have a budget. We've lost so much money because of that. And so, I mean, there's just so much wasted money right there. But there's a lot of wasteful uh, cash spent because of Bruce Rauner that we could easily, once he's out of there, we can spend towards uh, the pensions. Do you have a specific example of wasteful spending that you, you've seen that, uh, Bruce Rauner do? Um, at, my, at my office, we have about... 30 things that we uh that we uh we go to but uh offhand uh no i yeah could you maybe um, email me some of those just so yeah yeah yeah. I, yeah. I, i'd be curious what you, what you okay yeah yeah um, we, we are gonna get into finances next so i'd be curious some of those areas yeah you would think for that um on, on the the subject of pensions would you um do you believe the constitution should be amended so that previously earned retirement benefits can be changed i think that like i said earlier a promise is a promise and we need to make sure that the state workers are getting the best deal that they can. And so we don't need to um, punish people uh, in the future. We need to keep them getting what they're supposed to be owed and the new people that get hired to the same thing. So you're saying you would support the current level of benefits yes. for yes. any new hires? Yes. Because it's been pretty well you know, established with, with court that yeah. they can't go back and change yeah, I would say, the yeah, benefits. with new hires, I would say the same benefits. Doesn't that kind of keep escalating the problem? See, everybody... Just playing devil's advocate? Yeah, no, everybody likes to vilify, you know, the state workers say, hey, you know, because of their pensions, because of this, because of that, you know, that's why Illinois is broke. That's not the case. I mean, it just, it's been wasteful spending. And it's, it's not just been the last three and a half years. It's been longer than that, but I just... State workers are not the enemy. That's what they like to do is just, you know, kind of put the normal citizens against the state workers. It's, it's not like that. So just to make sure I'm understanding, you're saying that we should keep the same level of benefits for, for future employees. Yes. And then address the backlog by not starting any new government programs. Exactly. Until that is done. Yes. Okay. Um, the state's finances in general are in rough shape. Um, as you just noted, they have been for some time. Um, how would you work to change the financial trajectory of the state to get it on, on firmer fiscal standing? Well, like I said earlier, like no new programs until our debts are paid. But also, too, just we got to cut some wasteful, uh, wasteful spending. And we got we to gotta get Bruce Rauner out of there because, like I said earlier, you know, for the last three and a half years, we've, we've just been in a mess. And, I mean, that was all because we didn't have a budget. So once we have actually a good governor in there, we'll actually have a budget. We'll actually be able to do that. We'll be able to do this. And we'll just actually be able to pay people what they're owed and uh, be more fiscally responsible. Um, I, I'll play the devil's advocate and argue you will not be able to – that you would also need to be looking for areas to cut in order to have a balanced yeah. budget. Where would you look to cut you know, so people like to say that, you know, hey, it's, it's either one or the other. You know, either either have to cut or you spend. It's, it's not, the, you know, but I, uh, I think there's some programs out there that, you know, don't really, aren't really doing anything. But also there's uh, other money that we should be spending, like, towards pensions and such, too. But I, I want to just want to go back to 
I don't think we should start any more programs until we pay what we're owed, uh, pay the pensions and pay everything else. Are there broad areas where you see programs that aren't you know, doing what they're supposed to, or y'all have you encountered this as a county board member? You know, on on county state issues. On on county board, I mean, I've with the state we've seen, and we have a big list of this too, but we've seen you know just with Bruce Rauner, you know, people like things being really expensive that really shouldn't be that way. Like for example, here's here's one thing I would I would want to do. Um, I don't think state legislators should get a pension. You know, you you know spend a couple terms in there, you get a pension for life. I don't think that's right. I think that it's our civil duty as you know people that want to do some good just to do it and like get paid like that. I don't think it should be a pension like that. It's just it's ridiculous. And we're we're essentially, you know, taking the taxpayers money and I don't like that. So is, is that not a promise that was made that needs to be kept? So with with that, I mean, the people that were promised already, yes, I mean, it's a promise, it's a promise, but for the new legislators, I think that we should go away with pensions. But that's different than new state workers who you were saying should get yeah, the same. Yeah, but benefits. I don't really I don't really hold uh, legislators and state workers in the same category. Just because, you know, one runs for something, one just kind of is trying to feed their family. Um, if, if you were elected to the House and it came time to vote for a budget and um, the budget was unbalanced and it's, it's arguable this state has never truly had a balanced budget, how do you envision yourself voting on, on such a measure? You know, you look at this year's fiscal budget, um, I believe the latest estimation is it's out of whack by about a billion dollars. It relied on, like, assuming there's going to be a certain number of people who um, retired early, it's assuming the Thompson Center is going to be sold. A lot of assumptions that are that were built were baked into this budget. Um, how would you approach that if you were in the chamber? Well, first of all, I think we should be fiscally responsible. Um, and I don't want to vote for anything that's not balanced. Um, we need to do the best we can with the budget and we need to start just being fiscally responsible. And so I would vote for something when it's balanced. Um, switching gears to the campaign for a minute, um, you had a campaign ad um, the last couple of months that uh, where you said you were a volunteer firefighter and it, um, you saw how that, <clears throat> excuse me, the budget impasse affected that. Um, the way it was phrased, it sounded like you were a firefighter at the time of the impasse, given that it was filmed at the Litchfield Fire Department. A viewer could, I believe, reasonably infer you were a volunteer firefighter there. You were not a volunteer there. You were a, fire, a volunteer firefighter um, while you were in Missouri in college. Do you stand by that ad? I, I do, uh, but I, um, I was a volunteer firefighter, but we, uh, when it was reported, it was confused with my unofficial time and my official time. Okay, put together. I, guess, I guess explain to us the difference here. So uh, my official time um, was when I was actually official. When I went to college, that was my friend group. We, I helped with drills. We helped with everything there. And at the time, I mean, so I helped for a really long time, and we did drills. We responded to calls. We did all that. But for my official time, it was just a small amount of time. And so um, that was reported uh, wrong. So the unofficial time, about how long do you think that was for? Um, uh, like I said before, like, I, I don't really want to get into it, but I, it was reported, uh, with my unofficial time and my official time, and that's been corrected since. Do you, um, would you stand by that ad? Would you do anything differently? Yeah, I mean, it's because I, uh, I was a volunteer fireman, but, uh, I can understand why someone might misconstrue it. And so I do stand by it, but, uh, yeah. Uh, oh, go ahead. Um, going back to your, I was on your campaign website and looking at your priorities. Um, yeah. You noted that you would be a friend to farmers and would work to protect agriculture in the state. Elaborate on um, what you mean by that. What is ag need protection from? Um, so like, for example, um, like the tariffs right now are huge and they're affecting farmers in everywhere, but especially people in my district and they're scared that, Hey, you know, they're, they're getting a bandaid on it right now, but they're scared that, you know, a year down the road or a couple of years down the road that that's not going to be the case. It's just a bandaid. And so what I want to do is I want to protect them to make sure that, Hey, just because they're messing up in Washington doesn't mean that we're that 
you know, my family that other families are going to lose their farm too. What, so. what can you do at the state level, though, to mitigate, you know, as you noted, tariffs are a federal issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I want to do is I, I feel like we kind of, we do help farmers right now, but we kind of tie their hands behind their back too. And I just want to make it as easy for farmers to do everything that they need to do to make a profit. Because that, that is the industry that is Illinois. I mean, without farmers, we wouldn't actually have a state. Well, and You yeah. mentioned, you know, what, what are some of the things the state does now that hampers their ability? Uh, for example, um, let's see. Um, it just There's so many regulations in place, like with this, with that. And so when they're, when they're planting, when they're, uh, you know, putting fer fertilizer on, you know, just there's so many regulations right now that they just feel like, hey, we just can't go out and farm anymore. And... I've talked to a lot of farmers about it, and they're just like, hey, yeah, the state is just, you know, they don't use those nice words, but they're, they're not helping us is the, the nice way of saying it. And so I've, uh, I've, I'm a Farm Bureau member myself, and I, I've, you know, spoke with them, and I've spoke with their members, and I, I, I told them, and I, I, mean, I mean it, is I, I want to do everything I can to help them. Do you think there's a hesitation at the, at the state level to help them? Um I, mean, I think are, are they, are, I think the more they? north you go, I think there is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but down south, I think everybody's everybody understands the importance of the farming industry. Are there any specific um, issues the farm bureaus asked for your help with that you would back? Uh, they've just uh, we've we've talked extensively, and they've just said, "Hey, you know, have our back because we're scared of what tomorrow might bring." Um, also on your campaign website, you stated Second Amendment rights would uh, be another priority for you. What do you see as the issues there and what rights need to be protected? Like so, for example, um, Bruce Rauner, I think it was a month or two months ago, he did uh, a couple gun control bills then. Um, I just, where I'm from, everybody has a gun. It's just a way of life down there. My dad and I, we hunt, we shoot trap. You know, just it's the way of life. And everybody's scared that, you know, with the shootings that are happening nowadays and with everything like that, that their guns are going to get taken away or regulations are going to be in place that would make people criminals now when they're just, they were a legal gun owner before. You know, like, for example, um, there was a bill earlier this year that um, would make certain types of ammo and certain types of guns illegal. And a lot of people in my district, Democrat and Republican, both have those guns, and I think it's their right to have them. Um, you mentioned the governor and bills. Are there bills that he signed that you disagreed with? Uh, let's see. Two months ago, uh, there was the uh, gun control bills that he did. There was two of them. Uh, you guys reported on it. I remember reading it from you guys. Um, I think one was, let's see. I don't know. I just, I at the end of the day, I don't really want any more gun control bills. I, no one, Republicans, Democrats, no one wants a crazy person to have a gun. Nobody wants that. But the same day, I mean, at the same time of day, I mean, it just, we need to protect the gun owners' rights to just keep what they have because, you know, the bad guys are going to get the guns anyway. We need to make sure that the good guys have guns too. Is there anything that, you know, can be done? I, I would agree with you. Yeah. I think it is a bipartisan issue that people don't want people with mental health issues having guns. What can be done at the state level, if anything, on that? Well, like I said earlier, like, I think that there's enough gun regulations in place already. Mm -hmm that we just need to follow those instead of making more and more and more and more because the bad guys have the guns. I'm going to speak in generalities here, but yeah. Democrats are, I'd argue, are typically for stricter gun control. Um, your stance obviously indicates a different perspective. So if elected, how would you work with members of your own party on this issue to provide the types of rights you want to see there if they're pushing for the opposite of what you seek? So I'm running for state rep because I want to be a bipartisan, fiscally conservative person. And with the Democrats up north, I, they have a different opinion on guns as the Democrats down south. And by having some common ground with them already, uh, being Democrat, I'd like to you know show them the light per se. And you know Republicans up north too, and just I want to be, I want to be a bipartisan uh, state representative. Are you supportive of? Um the gun sanctuary resolutions we're starting to see pop up throughout the, the state. They're primarily well, central and south, southern Illinois. So uh, I believe actually my hometown was the first yeah. uh, town to do Finger, it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> but uh, I um, I understand at the, end, at the end of the day, people are scared that 
gun regulations are going to come in and they're going to lose their guns. They're going to lose, you know, this or that. And so they're just trying to fight back with everything they got. So I do support them because it just, it's kind of a last cry for help saying, Hey, please don't touch our guns. And it's the only thing they can do because at a, at a town level, at a city level, that's, that's all they got. Another one of your, uh, on your website, your priorities would be to fight for a fair and affordable education. Um, you had both for K-12 and higher ed levels. Tell us about your priorities there and what you mean by a fair education. Okay, so uh, with SB1, you know, us down south, we got a fair piece of the pie, and that's great, but there's still more that, we can, be, that can be done. Uh, my wife, she's a kindergarten teacher, and just some of the things that, well, actually, here, here's a better example. So I went to Hillsborough High School. And we had a room, and by the way, the teachers there, they do great with what they've got. You know, it's, you know, top notch. But it just, it's not as funded as well as someplace up north. And, you know, we had a study hall room that used to be a white carpet, but it was a brown carpet because over the last 50 years, people spit their chew on it. So it just, you know, it's kind of nasty. But uh, anyway, it just, it's, it's crumbling down. And then, you know, I've, I've seen Chicago public schools up north that they have a laptop for, to take home for do homework and they have another laptop for school in case they forget their laptop or that way they don't have to bring them back and forth. And you know, in my high school, we, we cut home ec, we cut like shop programs, we cut all this and we just had basic bare bones uh, things. And so when we want people to go to a college and, you know, do well and then come back and, you know, make our district better and all this, that we're kind of having them at a disadvantage when they haven't taken the classes that would make them score higher on the ACT that uh, up north uh, uh, high school would. And so we're just, we're discrediting the uh, southern districts. And so I think we need to continue doing SB1 like legislation that will continue to make it a fair piece of the pie for us down state schools. So that way we can get the better jobs. We can go to the Ivy League schools. We can, you know, make something big of ourselves. So that way we can make Southern Illinois to, uh, better. Is it solely um, finances that are going to help do that? Some more money, or is it going to be additional? I mean, it's all synergy, but I mean, money is, is what does it. I mean, okay, so the reason we have a teacher shortage right now is because we, teachers are the new coal miners. They're always worried, like, hey, are we going to have a job next year? They don't know. And my wife, uh, they fire and rehire the aides every year to, you know, to make sure that, hey, we have enough money to hire these people. And just so every year the teachers are worried, hey, are we going to have a job next year? And that's not right. So I just um, I, I want to I want to make education more of a, a safer place for teachers and uh, where they're getting good pay. So that way that they can teach the students to be more worried about their education. Also, I want to quit uh, tying teachers hands behind their back, too, because they're so worried about, you know, certain common core stuff. And some of it's good, some of it's not. But we're just we're tying the teachers hands right now and they can't just teach and so because of that because they don't know how they don't know if they're going to have a job the next year they we have less teachers uh telling uh future teachers to apply to get in there they say hey yeah you don't want to be a teacher you're gonna have to fight for your livelihood every year compared to another job where you're gonna be safe and so i i think it's a combination of us tying the teachers hands behind their back and just they're worried about having a job every year that we have a teacher shortage right now and I think with money, I think that helps with teacher's pay. I think that helps with that. It makes it, okay, it's more secure. And then we have better schools. More students are coming in. We have better programs. More teachers are hired. It just, it's all synergy. So money is the biggest part of that, though. Okay. Um, you mentioned the teacher shortage and better pay. Uh, there was a legislation uh, championed by Andy Menard that the governor vetoed that would increase the minimum pay for 40,000 40, yep. 40, is that something you would be in support of yes heck yes because right now it's I think it's 9,000 that was 1980 that they made that well just with inflation good god I mean that was over 30 years ago and no it just teachers work their butt off and they deserve at least 40 I'm going to play devil's advocate here for a minute and say yep. that it should be a local decision as to what school districts should pay their teachers uh, why would you? Why do you think this should be an exception to that? I mean, but kind of the contrary to that. I mean, do you think that uh, certain districts should be able to pay their teachers nine thousand a year? I don't know that any district is paying their teachers. I, I know, a year. but I mean, like, but legally they could. And yeah. so, I mean, I just I think like my wife's a teacher, so I she's in there. 
from seven o'clock in the morning at the very latest, sometimes six, mm -hmm. till about eight o'clock at night, getting stuff ready for the next day. And then on Friday, she's up there making sure stuff's ready for the weekend. And I mean, they're they're you know training the young minds of tomorrow. I think that they can at least make forty. I mean, because you know right now things cost a lot of money, inflation, taxes. It's not a great place to be in Illinois right now, but I want it to make Illinois a place not where we're not just surviving right now. I want us to thrive again, and right now we're not, especially teachers. Okay. I also noticed you mentioned trade schools in your remarks mm -hmm. on education. Um, what, what importance should they play in today's education economy? So I think that we should equally encourage trade schools as much as colleges and universities. Because right now, so when I went to college, like half my class, maybe not that much, but a good third of my class that graduated, they have jobs right now with a bachelor's degree that they could have gone without. And I have friends in trade schools that, you know, did trade schools, they're making great money. And I just think that as a society, we've not necessarily vilified trade schools, but we've said, hey, you are only smart, you are only successful if you go to a university, if you go to a college. And I don't think that's the case because obviously it's not because there's people that go to trade schools that make buku bucks. And we need to encourage that because there are more jobs for trade schools right now than there are for universities, especially here in Illinois. And so I think we need to equally encourage trade school, equally encourage universities and colleges and just uh, kind of say like, hey, you know, what do you want to do equally? I mean, trade schools and universities are equally important and equally successful. And still kind of vilifying, hey, you're not successful unless you go to a four-year university. Because then, I mean, we have the most, uh, there's more student debt today than ever before, too. And that's because we've been encouraging, hey, college is the only way. The, um, the candidate in your party seeking the governor's seat, J.B. Pritzker, um, says he wants to change the state to a graduated income tax. He's providing a few details on how this would be implemented um, or what levels would be that, that you might pay higher taxes. Would you support a graduated income tax? I do not support any higher taxes at all. For anyone? For anyone. So you would be fine sticking with the status quo? Yeah, or lessening it so. Okay. okay. Um, if elected to the seat and the Democrats retain the House, would you vote for Michael Madigan for another House for another term as House Speaker? Well, first of all, we don't know who's running for sure. Uh, you never know what's going to happen. You know, Rahm Emanuel, he said he wasn't going to run just, you know, yesterday. But at the end of the day, I am going to represent the people in my district and the people in my district solely, and that's it. Do you think Mike Madigan has been an effective leader? Of the Illinois House? I, I think it's been a long time that he's been in there, and I think that's impossible to answer because there's just so many variables. Why is it impossible to answer? Because there has been... He's been there a long time. There's a lot to look at. Um, there's so many variables with different governors, with different things, that it's, it's not really a good representation. Uh, we thank you for meeting with us today, and we invite you to give a closing statement, kind of your uh, your elevator pitch as to why you sh think you should be the victor on election night for uh, the 95th House District seat. So the people in my district, they're they're upset with the status quo. Right now, we've been kowtowing to Bruce Rauner at every turn, and you know my uh, my opponent, she's got one last election, she got 1.7 million dollars from Rauner, and her votes kind of uh, reflect that. And I'm not gonna kowtow to any leader. I'm going to represent the people in my district and the people in my district solely. I'm just tired of the middle class getting the shaft. I'm tired of our taxes being high. I'm tired of there being no jobs for young people. Just anything that's not by the interstate is dying away. And I'm tired of just people leaving. There was a person I talked to just two days ago. Uh, we were walking the district, and he said he could get paid $10 here for the same job that he makes 32 in Missouri. Why are we going to get people here moving here if they can make that much more in a different state? I want to fight for our middle class, I want to fight for lower taxes, and I just want to represent the people here instead of just bowing down to Bruce Rauner.